Hi guys, this topic is called classification. And before we get into defining what this topic is about, I've got a very simple activity for you to do. So hopefully you have some stationery around you and I would like you to get it all together, get as much stationery together as you can. You might have to get your pencil case and uh, empty out your pencil case so you've got all your things in front of you. And I want you to sort all of your stationery into different groups. So about three or four different groups. I'll just give you a few more seconds. So hopefully you've managed to sort some things into groups, some things that you had around you. And generally what students do is they sort the things into groups based on maybe their color. So you might have all the blue things together and all the red things together and all the green things together. Students can sort them based on what they're used for. So you might have writing things such as pencils and pens and textures and in one group, and you might have um, things that you use for correcting mistakes, like whiteout and erasers in another group, and you might have um, things like calculators and compasses and rulers in another group as like maths accessories. So you can see how there's a wide range of different ways that we can sort things into groups. So this leads into classification because classification is a process of organizing objects or in this case organisms uh, into groups based on their characteristics and then naming those groups. You did that activity with um, non-living things, so just some objects. But in this topic, we're going to be focusing on how we can group living things into groups based on their characteristics. So some examples of where classification can be found in society is at the supermarket. So in the supermarket, you'll see that uh, there's different aisles. Uh, the aisles are arranged based on what the food is that's inside those aisles. So we have an aisle for you know health food and cereals. We have an aisle for um, junk food usually and soft drink. We have an aisle for cleaning products and laundry products. And we also have different sections of the supermarket for other things, like for dairy, uh, for fresh meat. Uh, we have a bakery as well. So you can see that in the supermarket, we have different sections of the supermarket with different products that share similar characteristics. We have libraries. We have um, books are based on genre in the library, um, and they're organized by genre. So you have you know a section of the library for nonfiction and a section for fiction. You have you know, comedy, you have horror, you have all these different uh, genres, different sections of the library, and all the books within each section set, share similar characteristics. Uh, iTunes, we have different genres of music that you can look up on iTunes. And uh, there might be many other examples of classification that you can think of as well. So some plants and animals actually fall into a number of groups, not just one particular group, but a number of groups. For example, a plant can be a member of a particular species, but it can also be classified as a weed. And a lot of weeds are what we call introduced species, which means that they have been brought to Australia from another country. Sometimes introduced species can be really good for us, uh, like cows and sheep. They were introduced into Australia from other countries. But sometimes introducing a species from another country has actually backfired and they've become a pest species. So we've got cane toads, foxes, rabbits. These were all introduced from other countries and these have become pests because they kill off uh, native wildlife. And on the right-hand side there, you see there's a plant and that plant is called lantana. Lantana is a pest species of plant. It's basically a weed that chokes native plants. So it's a, a pretty bad one. It's also a really good movie as well. I would recommend checking that out. Um, but cane toads, they were introduced uh, to try and control the uh, locusts that were in Queensland. Um, that, and the, the locusts were destroying the, the cane plantations in Queensland. So one solution is obviously just to use heaps of chemicals. Obviously, that's not 
a really good solution in the long run because the chemicals can affect the environment and obviously our health as well. So they came up with the idea of introducing cane toads and uh, it worked for a while. I mean, it, the cane toads were eating all the cicadas and all the insects that were destroying the crops. But cane toads are also, also poisonous. And so a lot of native animals have been eating cane toads. And then, of course, they die because the toads are poisonous. And so now we have this huge plague of cane toads in Queensland that we're trying to deal with. So um, likewise with foxes, foxes um, obviously kill rabbits. And rabbits aren't really good if you've got a lettuce plantation or vegetable plantations. So foxes can be good in that sense, but obviously foxes kill off native animals as well. Classification isn't just for living things. Uh, as you've just demonstrated in that first activity, you've done it for stationary items. Scientists also classify things like rocks. In year eight science, you learn about how we can classify different rocks based on how they're formed. We have igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, and metamorphic rocks. So they, they differ based on how they're formed. We classify atoms based on a number of characteristics, mainly whether they're a metal or a non-metal or a metalloid. And we can classify liquids as well based on whether they're an acid or whether they're a base, whether they're a, they're a, whether they're a solution or whether they're a suspension. So you can see that scientists use classification in a range of different ways, not just for living things, which is what we're going to be focusing on, but for other non-living things as well. The actual science of classifying living things is called taxonomy, and the scientists that specialize in it are called taxonomists. So there are people that actually specialize in characterizing things or in categorizing things, I would say. They illustrate how particular organisms have characteristics in common by using a key. A key can be very useful in, in identifying unknown things based on the characteristics, and the simplest type of key that we're mainly going to look at is called a dichotomous key. And so you can see at the start of that word, we've got the, the prefix di, and di means two. So at each stage of the key, in a dichotomous key, it branches off into two groups. And these have to be easy to observe and not be open to interpretation or opinion. So basically, you can't characterize animals based on their height or based on their weight or things that will change over time. And we're going to talk about that a bit later on. Here we have two examples of how we can represent a dichotomous key. And in this case, we're trying to group this big group of buttons here into some smaller groups. And we could actually name those smaller groups if we wanted to, which is what happens in real life with animals. So we've got this big group of buttons, and we have this way or this method of dichotomous key, and we have this form of a dichotomous key. And in my opinion, this form is much easier to understand, and we'll be focusing mainly on this form. Uh, this, uh, hang on a second, why isn't my thing working here? There we go. This thing, this table, is much more difficult to interpret, in my opinion. So they're both dichotomous keys, it's just that the one on the left is a bit easier to follow, and I'll show you why. So let's say that we've got, we start off with all of our buttons, our big group of buttons. And we split them into two groups. In this case, whether they're round or whether they're straight-sided. So we would split them into two groups. Why two groups? Because this is a dichotomous key, and di means two. So we've got two branches here from our main group. Let's go with our round buttons. Our round buttons are then grouped into two smaller groups, ones with two holes and ones that have four holes. And then let's go with the ones with two holes. We can then group them further based on whether they're striped or whether they're plain. And so you can see that there's only one left in the striped ones. So we could give that a name. Like a, in real life, we would call it a, we would give it a Latin name. But in this case, this is just an example. You can describe this striped button as being striped has two holes, is round, and it's a button. Or you can go the other way around and say it's a button that's round, it has two holes, and it's striped. 
And so whenever we refer to that button's name, we would know what sort of characteristics it has based on its classification. And likewise, we could give this a name, we could give this one a name, uh, we can give uh, this one a name, and so on. We could give them all Latin names if we wanted to. But at the end of the day, we've grouped them into smaller groups based on their very specific characteristics that are not going to change over time. One last thing about dichotomous keys is that in order for them to be effective, they need to be what we call a strong key. Sometimes an organism's features will change as it ages and develops over time, and these, this can make them harder for them to identify. This is why we should separate them based on features that will not change over time, and in doing so, we create a strong key. For example, if I wanted to classify all of you guys in this class based on features that would not change over time, and therefore I'd be creating a strong key, what features could we use? Um, I cannot use your hair color or length because your hair color or length will change over time. Uh, it might even change next week. So we want to use features that will not change. I can't use your, your height, for example, um, or your weight. I can't use any of those features because they will change over time. I want to think, pick some things that will not change. So perhaps your eye color. Your eye color will pretty much more or less stay the same throughout your whole life. So I could group you based on, um, so I need two groups, remember, because it's a dichotomous key. So um, I can have my class as like the first group, and I need to split you into two groups. So we could have, um, you know, the first one group could be brown eyes and the other one could be um, other. So another color other than brown, because if I grouped you just based on brown eyes or blue eyes, what about all the other students that have green eyes or some other color of eyes? Um, so we can have you grouped into brown eyes or other. And then if I want to get more specific, I could then say I could pick this group of brown-eyed people and I could group you into two more groups. I could group you based on whether you've got like attached earlobes because most people have one of two different types of earlobes. So we could have some attached and some like that are not attached. And if you want to find out a bit more about what those two types of earlobes are, you can just Google image search that and you'll see that there's yeah two types of earlobes. There's some that sort of dangle down and are a bit bigger, and there are some that are attached, and they're really small earlobes. And then I could group you even further based on characteristics that will not change over time. So the main thing I need to emphasize with this particular slide is that when we make a, a dichotomous key like this one, and like the one with the buttons, we need to pick features that will not change over time. Uh, bone structure is another thing that we look at. Um, the number of legs you have, or whether you have legs or flippers, or things like this. These are things that are not going to change over time. We don't want to use things like your height, your weight, or your hair color or length, because they will change over time. Now I've got an activity that allows you to create your own dichotomous key. There are 85 Mr. Men and Little Miss characters from the books by Roger Hargraves, and I want you to classify at least 15 of these characters into smaller groups using a dichotomous key of your own. And so I'm going to give you an example on the next slide. So you've got all of your Mr. Men and Little Miss characters, your 15 that you've chosen. And the first step, because it's a dichotomous key, the first step is going to decide how you're going to split this big group into two smaller groups. So with my example, I've grouped them based on their gender, so female or male. Normally, we do not group organisms based on their gender. But in this particular example, I'm going to be picking some characteristics that, yeah, you wouldn't normally use because they would change over time. But for the purposes of this activity, we can use some superficial characteristics just to get some practice using a dichotomous key. So 
I've grouped all of my characters into male or female. So I've got my females on the left and my males are on the right, but I'm going to go a bit further with that male group and split them into two more groups. So the two groups that I've chosen to um, classify my male characters into, uh, whether they're blue or whether they're not blue. So I've got my not blue ones on the left and my blue male characters are on the right and I'm going to split them into two more groups. And the two groups that I've chosen to split them into are whether they have a nose or whether they don't have a nose. So I've got the ones with the nose here, Mr. Grumpy and Mr. Perfect, and the ones without a nose are Mr. Busy and Mr. Cool. And so now, because I've only got one or two of those characters left at the end of that, that run, I'm actually going to, I can give them a name now, and we tend to give species Latin names. So if I wanted to be a bit creative, I could call the ones with the nose Ceruleum nasus, which means blue nose, because they are blue and they have a nose. And the other group I could call Ceruleum planus, which is blue and flat because they have a flat face without a nose. And this is basically how it works in real life with animals. Uh, we give them Latin names, and from those names, we can sort of determine some characteristics about them. If I pick the group of males that are blue that have a nose, I can then create a bit of a description about them. I can say that these guys are a male character that's blue and have a nose. And I get that description by tracing the dichotomous key all the way back to where we started with that big group. So this is a really good example of how we can use features to create a, di a dichotomous key. I could then go on to look at that group of males that are not blue and split them into two more groups. And I could look at the group of female characters as well and divide them into smaller groups. So with this activity, you can use some of the characteristics that I've chosen, but I would encourage you to be a bit creative and use some of your own characteristics that you can identify with these characters.